The Bitcoin Standard Podcast brings you seminars from safedean.com, my independent online learning platform where you can take my online courses on the economics of Bitcoin and economics in the Austrian school tradition, join our two live weekly seminars, and read my books before they are published. Sign up now for access to the draft of my forthcoming economics textbook, Principles of Economics, and take five full online courses based on my books, The Bitcoin Standard, The Fiat Standard, and Principles of Economics. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by Crowd Health. Crowd Health is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to the show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. Crowd Health is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable healthcare. Crowd Health holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash upfront without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for Crowd Health and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coiner friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning every day's pair change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Get paid in Bitcoin regardless of who you work for and regardless of who is paying you. All thanks to a premium service I personally love and use, and that is Bitwage. Thanks to Bitwage, I receive my books royalties in Bitcoin. It is cheaper, faster, and easier. It is a true set it and forget it system, and Bitwage has been offering this premium service since 2014. Anyone can sign up and use it right away. No restrictions or limits, fully non-custodial. You can even split your incoming payment, get part in Bitcoin and part to a bank account you specify. It could not be easier and I cannot recommend Bitwage highly enough. Go to bitwage.com and sign up now and get paid in Bitcoin with your next payment or salary. Ray, thank you for joining us, welcome. Hey everybody, how y'all doing? Very good, man. Good to have you. It's my honor to be here. I'm looking forward to this a long time here with the Titans. <laughs> if I'll be beat, all of education, honestly, I, the Fiat Center is amazing, brother. You hit one out of the park there and hit every possible vector, bro. Savage. Utterly savage. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Appreciate that coming from you. Uh, so uh, we wanted to host you to talk about your uh, startup and also Bitcoin in general, what Bitcoin means to you. So let's begin first. Tell us a little bit more about yourself before Bitcoin. How did a no coiner Ray find Bitcoin? Uh, well, no coiner Ray has had a lot of problems with uh, payments. You know, no coiner Ray has been a serial, I've been a serial entrepreneur for 24 years, right? My first startup was in 1999. I just learned, I just got a computer like two years before that. And I got like a first computer at the age of 19 and I was old, right? And I just started teaching myself how to code. Uh, I didn't have any help. And then I just started making websites. And um, one day I, I heard a ringtone on some guy's phone. It was a Mission Impossible ringtone. It was a monophonic Nokia phone. You know, eh, 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 eh. I was like, wow, that's cool, man. I got to get one of those. 
I spend nine hours researching all over the internet, trying to find this ringtone, and it's so damn hard. I found this huge thread on the cell phone site, 10,000 replies, because it was all about people sharing their ringtones. Finally, I had to type in the codes myself into the phone, and it worked. I was like, I got to make this easier. So I built basically the Napster of ringtones. It was peer-to-peer -peer ringtone sharing site where people could go in, upload, and share a ringtone. And then I hacked the, the telcos uh, web pages, their web forms, to send the SMS so that I could send the ringtone directly as an SMS to people, and it was free. And uh, then I started charging people for it, and it blew up. It went from zero to a multi-million dollar business in, in less than six months. It was quite the adventure. That was my first startup, but then I had to start working with the record labels. And this was kind of a scary time. It was Napster, just got taken down. If you think people are afraid of the bank style, back then people were even more afraid of the record labels. So it was quite the adventure. So, but every, you know, the biggest problem I had with that startup was the payments. Because I was essentially dealing with an unbanked population. Teenagers that wanted these ringstones, right? They didn't have a debit card. So they would, you know, borrow their mother's debit card. And then I would get these chargebacks the next day. And it was massive chargebacks. There's no one what this was. So I was looking for alternative methods, you know? And I started figuring out ways to charge some phones, this, whatever I could find. 12 startups after that, every single startup I had had the same problem. It was always payments. So when I heard about Bitcoin, and I think the first time I heard about it was on a, a web forum. I was trying to sell my motorcycle. And someone, hey, he said, sell it for Bitcoin. I was like, what's this Bitcoin thing? And I started researching, and I was like, oh, this just sounds like, like nerd money. You know? I didn't actually read the white paper. But then fast forward sometime between 2011 and 2013, probably 2012, I read the white paper. I was like, wow, this is actually peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. I mean, that's what it says, right? The first words. And I was like, this thing might actually be able to help. And it wasn't until the Egyptian revolution really kicked off that I really started getting it. That was 2011, actually, yeah. So it was really when the Egyptian revolution started kicking off that you know, I went to Tahrir Square. Um, it was I was the one on the plane to Egypt, and I got into a huge street ball on January 25th in Tahrir Square, you know, like... 800 people died that night I was there. I mean, it's a long story. I'm actually writing a book about it. But when I came back to America, I started seeing that the dialogue, the narrative that people were being fed was the exact opposite, the diametric opposite of what I saw. And that's really what it took to get me into Bitcoin in, in a fanatical fashion. I had to be plunked out of the matrix. You know, the fiat standard is so powerful. It pervades every, every possible pore of the human psyche, right? So... I needed it to be jacked out of the matrix and Tahrir Square did that for me, began me on that journey. And then I really began to ask myself the question, like, what is money? Where does it come from? Why is it so important to us? What's going on? And then I really began to embrace as something, as the tool that actually gave the power back to us. And the further I fell down the rabbit hole, the deeper and stronger my connection to Bitcoin got. Yeah, it's a familiar experience. I'm sure a lot uh, can relate. Once, once you get bitten, it's just uh, it's almost like those zombie movies, but in a good way. Um, so you just can't get the snap out of it. It's like uh, you ever see that movie by John Carpenter, They Live, with the uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper, where he puts on those sunglasses <laughs> and just starts thinking about all the civilian messages, right? Your entire reality starts to shift and you start to ask me like where what's the fiat angle in this like there's obviously lies right and that's the thing is like we all know they're we being lied to the emotional stat state of every human is not strong enough to embrace the fact the reality that the lie is 180 degrees they're massive all pervading lies and that's very hard to accept if you're still a normal person yeah absolutely so you Swallowed the orange pill, and then um, what did you do about it? Well, you're an entrepreneur, so what did you do? Well, I started uh, looking for my next startup, right? So this was a really hard time in my life when this was all happening, and I was, I took a whole bunch of the orange pills, man, and red pills, everything. It was an old the trip. I will lock all my friends. I was basically just like, you know, scraggling around from cafe to cafe looking for my next big startup. So I had many failures before this, you know, I... I had two really successful startups. So when my first two were really successful. And uh, I went on a kind of journey where I just, 
I got tired of, of, of technology. I had to bail, right? Because uh, the music industry kind of drove me a little crazy. I had some issues at the time, so I went to find myself. So I became a traveling gypsy, MMA fighter, and box surge, traveled around the world for a couple of years doing that. But then my mother got divorced. She lost her house, so I had to buy her a new house. So I said, okay, it's time to go back to startups. And that was quite arrogant, you know, God has a way of humbling the arrogance. And I certainly was humbled. I had like nine failures in a row. And some of them did make money, but they weren't that huge hit that I was looking for. I was looking to make an impact in the world. It wasn't about the money. I've always been like that. So I kept going from one thing to the other. And then when I discovered Bitcoin, I was like, okay, it's time to build something on this. So my first Bitcoin startup was a POS for retail merchants to accept Bitcoin. I thought, wouldn't it be cool if retail merchants could accept Bitcoin easily? Well, life it is cool, but no one know who. I got kicked out of hot dog stands, bars, clubs, whatever. No one wanted to do with it. And if he did try it, it wouldn't last. Because no one had, there wasn't enough Bitcoin in circulation for it to be useful as a firm solve problem that simply did not exist. So then I said, okay, mission number one, let's get Bitcoin into the hands of more people. And I looked at the situation and I said, does Bitcoin really solve the real problems in the West? It doesn't. We have a function financial system here. Whatever you're going to say about it, it still works. But in the global south, people don't have a functioning financial system. And I was born in Egypt. I went back there and I went to Nigeria, especially in when I went to Nigeria, that I really began to understand the problems that people have with money. So then that's when Pax Fulton was born. So I built this uh, peer to peer marketplace to allow people to buy Bitcoin, any form of money, and sell Bitcoin for any form of money. It's essentially a function that is a kind of universal translator for money, you know, where money can be translated into anything. You could buy Bitcoin with a gift card, or you could exchange that Bitcoin for another gift card or a cash deposit or a PayPal transfer or whatever form of payment you wanted. And it started to work. Uh, Paxful was successful in that, number one, the African youth, particularly the Nigeria, showed us what the real use case for Bitcoin is. It's killer app is not just as a store of value. It's as a means of exchange to help people with the biggest problem in the world, not problems what I call economic apartheid. My PR team didn't like that word. They thought it was too strong. But if you talk to your average person in the global south, especially in hyper-restricted prisons for money like Egypt or Nigeria, you're going to understand that economic apartheid is very real. It is a shadow system that keeps people trapped in their local markets. It's extremely difficult to get money into those markets, and it's 10 times harder to get money out of those markets. And the problems are reverberate right from the top. And from the top up of those markets, they all have a gun pointed at their heads anyway. It comes out of Brussels and D.C. and the city of London. So Paxil got money. They, well, it showed, number one, that the real use case for Bitcoin is a, its ability to transcend orbiters and to break through the walls of economic apartheid. And that any person without permission, any young person can jump into this, get their first Bitcoin and find an arbitrage drought to make a profit. And there have been many success stories. And every time I hear one, I really smile and, and I cry inside. Tears of joy, of course. The second thing you did was it got Bitcoin into the global stock. That was a huge, huge trial. When I was first trying to open up the market in Nigeria about eight years ago, it was hard, brother. It was how do you get, how do you, how do those Africans pay for the Bitcoin? It's so hard to get money out of Nigeria. Now, and back then even more, all companies are built in Nigeria just to get money out of there. And it usually happens to the exportation of oil, animal skins, cacao beans, whatever they can. So it was $10 million for a minimum order of cacao beans shipped from Lagos to Rotterdam. I didn't have $10 million. So what was I going to do? I did what I always do. I hacked my hacker, right? So I showed these Nigerians how they could take the gift card that they got from a family member in California who bought at a gas station with cash or someone that they were doing some gig work for. And I showed them how they could take that gift card code traded it with someone from China on our platform and to get Bitcoin. They would have to give a significant discount, yes, but the discount was actually worth the price for immediate limit. And considering, you know, they pay up to 30% or sometimes up to 50%, you 
you know, penalty for accessing foreign FX, it was a great deal to them. And it worked. $60 million a week started to float from that one quarter. Well, hang on, what, what year was that? That was, that really kicked off in Africa in about 2016, I'd say, late 2016, early. And when did you start? Started Paxville 2015. 15, okay. So by 2016, you're already doing, you're saying $60 million uh, a week from just gift cards. Volume in gift cards alone, just in that one corridor, from America to Nigeria to China. And then wow. from there, all this Bitcoin started to flood into Nigeria. The Nigerians, being the incredibly art entrepreneurial people that they are, started using it for emittances. Started using it to get money into the country from the West, to get money to other African countries they were connected to, like Ghana, Cameroon, etc. And that's how we got, you know, all this Bitcoin into Africa. That's why Nigeria is seeing Bitcoin adoption right now, was the Nigerian youth were just so, they were so entrepreneurial, they jumped right on that and they blew the fuck up and it was beautiful to see. I'm, I'm happy to play the part in that. Yeah. And uh, what about the rest of the countries in Africa? So you, I, I see you're always talking about uh, Nigeria. I'm curious how it compares to other countries. Well, Nigeria is the biggest. Ghana, though, Nigeria is our number one market. America is our second biggest market. India is our third. And Lula Ghana is our fourth, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's amazing traders there. I think Kenya is probably fifth. And then there's South Africa, of course. Other markets are coming up fast, like Cameroon, et cetera. Essentially, every single market in Africa has to run at this potential. The reason I focused on Nigeria was just even I was so impressed with their business acumen and their ability to just go after things. You know, this money game that we're in is a game full of savages, honestly, and a bunch of monsters from the West that are hyper aggressive. The Africans are very gentle people by and large. But the Nigerians had a little extra spice that was much appreciated in getting this started. And that's why I focused on Nigeria. The quality of the people, as far as an entrepreneur is concerned, I don't want to see anything like it. And honestly, Nigeria lives in the future. Nigeria is at least 10 to 20 years ahead of every other country in the world. If you look at what's happening there right now, it is the harbinger and a foreteller of everything that's going to be speaking, not just Africa, not just the global south, but in the entirety of the world. I can talk at length about believe me. Yeah, I think a lot of people have this uh, impression that all of these banking problems are happening in all these backward economies and that if you live in the West, then uh, these are things that don't concern you. But I think the last year, particularly after the Canadian protests and after the Canadian government has been at the bank accounts of its political opposition, and not even, you know, any kind of uh, prominent uh, political opposition, just uh, normal truckers and people who donated $50 for truckers. Once it got to that point, I think it became very clear for a lot of people that Nigeria is not uh, behind. Nigeria is ahead. In fact, we're headed more and more toward a world in which we see that. And recently I saw you sharing a lot of stuff about CBDC implementation in Nigeria. So tell us what's been going on there. Give us a glimpse of the future. Yeah, so the e Naira was the first CBDC experiment in Africa, and it started a while ago. It actually started several, I think, a year and a half ago, maybe two. So Litros, Nigeria is the first market for this. And uh, Nigerians rejected it. They rejected it completely, and they went straight for Bitcoin. The Nigerians are quite wise. They know not to trust anything from their government, and they embraced Bitcoin. They were already going full steam ahead with Bitcoin. And there's been a constant war. There was a protest called NSARS, right? SARS is this kind of police paramilitary unit the Nigerian government deployed. Essentially, to crack down on the youth, especially the ones that were using Bitcoin. And they accused them of being terrorists. They accused them of being scammers. They still, they have shaked them down for the Bitcoin, throw them in jail. One of our traders, one of our employees, was actually the fact that we have to help them get out. And SARS was a huge moment for Nigeria. It stopped in like a year and a half ago because at that moment, you know, the crackdown was so severe and so brutal that the youth realized that if they don't take action against this right now, there is no going back. And that's why I, the youth in Nigeria right now are pushing for a certain candidate, right? The youth candidate is a fellow named Peter Obi. 
and he's running against two dinosaurs from the old political elite. And the youth are so fervent behind this man that it just inspired me tremendously. I am now a supporter of Peter Obi. I don't know what the future tells. I don't know if Peter Obi is going to be able to work the miracle that we need, but the youth are behind him because they know that if they don't take a stand now, their entire lives will be wasted and the lives of their families will be in vain. The youth revolution that we are seeing right now in Nigeria, the reason I focused on it so much is because this is the most important election in the world. This is when the most powerful economy in Africa, the most populous nation in Africa, almost 20 to 20 million people can break away from this fiat stand. The Nigerian youth are actively doing this right now. And they are doing so with no help from anyone. There's no international attention on what's going on down there. People still think they're a bunch of scammers <laughs> running around trying to swindle old women. This is not the case. I focus on it so much. I'm using every single ounce of strength in whatever platform is available to me to alert the world to this. But should of Nigeria break it free, it will change everything. It will have ripple effects across the entirety of human civilization. I say this with no hint of hyperbole at all. And there is absolutely, without apologies, this will change the world. If Nigeria can break free right now, they are the line of Africa. They will take all of Western Africa with them. They will inspire every other nation in Africa to look away from the, you know, the unipolar ambitions of the West, and they will start building in their own spheres. They will radically terraform the world. I mean, this is, uh, it's pretty uh, encouraging to hear you get so animated about it. So what, why specifically do you think this is, uh, what is it about what people are doing there? I'm, then, let me play the skeptic a little bit. What is it exactly that is so important? I mean, to be fair, pretty much everybody at all times has always thought that the current election they're in is the most important election in history. Why is this different this time? And what do you think it is exactly? Um, and really, is it is it really Bitcoin? Because like, yeah, I can tell that maybe the volume is large by Paxful status, but I, is, is the volume really large by Nigeria standards? So like, how big is Bitcoin really in Nigeria that you are placing it as this kind of enormous catalyst for the country overall? I would put Paxful's volume of uh, Bitcoin transactions at about 1% or a fraction of 1% compared to the entirety of peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin transactions happening in Nigeria. And by a fraction of 1%, I mean like one-tenth of 1%. The vast majority of these peer-to-peer -peer transactions are not happening on possible peer-to-peer -peer or Binance peer-to-peer -peer or local Bitcoin or anything. They're happening on Telegram, WhatsApp, in person, through these back channels. It happens every single day on a scale we can't even imagine. That's the amazing thing about Nigeria. When you talk to Nigerians, yes, there's some speculation going on over there naturally, but by and large, the majority of these transactions are all real use cases, payments, remittances, the Nigerians have taken Bitcoin as a means of exchange to an entirely different level. And you talk to the traders on the ground there, that's what they'll tell you. The Nigerians are not into NFTs, the monkey pictures, and all this nonsense. No, they're out to do real business. There is no nation in the world that has been throttled more by the fiat standard than Nigeria. If I had to give a close second, I would give it to Egypt, where I was born. These are nations that should be ridiculously wealthy. Every city in there should be like Dubai. But because they kind of have been trapped, their money has been trapped in this prison, they are not able to do that now that Nigerians have figured out a way around it. And no, when Nigerians figure something out, they mind the hell out of it, man. Consider that in, it was in January of 2020, remains into Nigeria were 2.5 billion. By September of that same year, there was a 98% fall in the amount of remittances. It went down to 55 million. Now, granted, COVID had something to do with it. But the big thing was the Nigerians figured out they could send money back home as Bitcoin to turn it immediately into Naira, and they wouldn't have to you know, pay Western Union fees, wait this time, all this stuff. They, and they went at it with a vengeance. And all these services popped up to them. It's not just Paxel, but all these small wallets and quarter partners, St. Cash, all of them started doing this. The Nigerian jumped on it. 
And then what happened? The government saw that and they're like, wait a minute, where'd all this FX go? We had 2.5 billion coming in. Now it's only 55 million. What's going on? And that's when they put the, the ban. They forbid any of their banks doing any business with cryptocurrency exchanges because they're like, what happened? You know, the biggest fear of any of these global South countries is that Bitcoin, crypto, or whatever they want to call it, will start taking foreign FX out of the country, which naturally hurts their currency. And it's also less money for, you know, their corrupt leaders to buy more penthouses in Miami with, right? And that's why they put the ban. The Nigerian youth, once they saw it, they could use Bitcoin for remittances, they were all over it. That's how fast things can move in Nigeria. And that's how the government reacted. And what was the result? Peer to peer volumes jumped by over 20% the next day, the second the government put the Fed ban in. You simply cannot stop the Nigerians from doing what they want to do. That's very heartening to hear. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is what it really comes down to. It's um, ultimately, you can send money across borders without having to go through your government. And that's just completely transformative of the relationship that you have with your government, as I say in the fiat standard, because your only way under the fiat system, your only way of accessing the global economy, the division of labor, the only way that you can buy and sell internationally is to go through your government's central bank. And now you don't have to anymore because of Bitcoin. So it's it's really nice to see it happening out in the wild. And in, as you said, it's such a country that is so enormous, so huge. But really 98% drop in uh, bank-based remittances. Does that include a drop in, or in things like Western Union and all these remittances mm -hmm. services or just the banks? Well, all of it, everything, including Western Union as well. And, you know, the, the, here's, I want to like bring this to attention. This is important. So, you know, Western Union brings in all this foreign FX, but the government, the country doesn't get it. Western Union keeps that FX for themselves and they just balance their flows, right? So all of that money, that money coming up to Western Union doesn't really enrich the country at all. And this is my argument with all of these global South leaders, right? And I started first this dialogue with Egypt, you know, Nigeria is tough, but the Egyptians are even more stubborn, believe me. The central bank there has banned cryptocurrency, right? So we met with them, they managed to agree to, uh, to all start, you know, allowing us to educate people about it. But really, I need to get to a guy like Sisi, and I need to go to him, and I need to give him the spiel. And here's the spiel. You guys are desperate for foreign effects, because that's what keeps the price of your currency strong. With all the dollars and euros, Lead your economy. If you don't have that pile of hard money, quote unquote, what they consider hard money, then your your currency will take a massive dive, right? Well, guess what, guys? Now you're used to exporting your labor force outside of the country and having them bring in FX, most of which Western Union gobbles up for itself. But what if there was a way you could put the people inside your country? to work bringing in FX into the country, dollars, euros, yet, whatever you want. Wouldn't that be awesome? They're like, yeah, that would be great. And I say, it's very possible. It's already happened. You already have all these brilliant unemployed young people in your country, whether it's Nigeria, Egypt, whatever, Kenya, that are doing all of this work, gigs on places like Upwork, et cetera. And there's so much talent over there, it's crazy. But the hardest thing is how do I pay me these people, right? How are you, if I want to get some talent over there to do something for you, how are I going to pay them? Well, guess what? They're very happy to accept crypto. And people are very happy to pay them in crypto and Bitcoin. What if you, the government, allow people, your citizens, to come into any post office and exchange their crypto for local money? You would essentially be putting millions of young people in your country to work, bringing in Bitcoin. You could then take that Bitcoin, give it your form, your local currency. You could take that Bitcoin with any OTC transaction, turn it into whatever hard currency you want. This is possible. The government could be bringing in foreign effects at a tremendous rate, keeping all of it for itself while putting its local population to work. This would radically transform the global south. They would give all these global south leaders, countries, markets, the ability to resist this, this evil kind of gun being held to their head by the IMF, the BIS, right? 
Because that's the gun that every global south market has to its head. That if you start printing up your own money and putting your people to work, well, you can't do that. You have to borrow our money at interest or else. And what is it or else? Or else, hey, we control price discovery on every, on every Forex in the world. We can destroy the value of your currency overnight. And then you all get poor. Bitcoin fixes this. Yeah. I mean, I'll... I'll, um, I'll push back a little bit here in the sense that I don't think it takes such a nefarious conspiracy to uh, devalue the currency of your average dysfunctional third world uh, government because realistically the government is doing the hard lifting on its own. You don't need to posit some kind of nefarious plot in order to bring these currencies down. The Nigerian government doesn't need any help or any uh, conspirators uh, plans in order to get it to devalue its currency or the Egyptian pound, which has just hit 30 to the dollar, a huge milestone. I mean, it was 10 years ago, it was around five uh, to the pound, I think, or something like that, five, six. And I remember in 2016, 2017, when the first devaluation, uh, first major devaluation was happening, it was already getting devalued, but then around 2017, the official exchange rate caught up with the black market freight and then it went up to 15 16 17 or something like that around that time i remember i was a part of an uh, egyptian uh, bitcoin group on facebook that was pretty popular back then i think it had several thousand members but then it got shut down and um i know the admin he he turned it into some kind of uh, into a private page and changed the topic and he made the topic about something completely unrelated to bitcoin and then, uh, you know, I, I think he was in trouble at some point, and then he just disappeared to, um, and stopped talking about it. So I'm, I'm quite glad to hear that you're saying that things have uh, picked up. But I, I don't have much information about what the Bitcoin scene is like in Egypt these days. It doesn't look like it is as active as one will, would hope. Oh, what, are you, what is your impression from your on the ground and uh, startup data? Yeah, well, let's keep in mind two things. Number one, crypto is still illegal in Egypt. And number two, Egypt is renowned for its torturers. Yes. Like from Mubarak, Egypt took torture to a whole new level. Egyptians disappear all the time for a lot less. In Egypt, they will come and take your ass by hand and you will disappear. We'll come back and you might come back gay. Who knows? It's not a joke in Egypt. It is a really rough place. But the Egyptians are strong people. We just need to, yeah, see in Egypt, you, you're not going to, you're not going to defy like a, a military dictatorship like that. Like the Egyptians will, you know, they will just shoot you down on the street. I've actually seen this happen, right? So you have to go through the front door and I do want to help Egypt very much. I, I love Egypt. I love the Egyptian people. I'm, I was born there. I am Egyptian. Uh, it's going to take some work. I'm going to need to get the CC himself. And I'm going to need to paint this picture to him. And I have a lot of respect for the man. I mean, he's building up this new city, right? He's hot launched the Hayat Karima program, which in Arabic means better life, which is putting, I think, six to eight billion dollars to completely redo the countryside. So the guy is not just some military dictator, he's actually taking moves to actually help the country. So there is hope on the horizon for Egypt. Egypt is a complex situation, though. It's going to take a couple of years. I'm going to have to keep the lines going but something needs to happen there was look my mother's life savings is trapped in egypt right now the central bank of egypt lured her in and said hey we'll give you 25 percent apy so she put her entire life savings there then what happened the 25 percent apy was nice but the fact that the currency went down like for 50 percent completely demolished that and then they lowered the apy to nine percent and then they first started forbidding her from taking out more than like 40 bucks a week. So the whole thing is a scam, right? Now, it's easy to sit there and blame Egypt, but they're under pressures themselves from the outside. That's why these things happen. Yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah, I can see your point, but I think uh, there's, uh, there probably is enough blame to go around in terms of the monetary policy. I mean, I, I don't follow the the, the politics very close. If, if if you're going to be building projects, you need to secure funding from somewhere. And it seems, I mean, there's just 
this uh, do something bias in economic policy where people need to be seen, uh, presidents and leaders need to be seen as doing things, building things. And that's presented as if it is what's going to solve things. Whereas from my perspective, the way that I look at it is that this is really what is sowing the seeds for the problems of the future. In other words, people look at the spending, you know, we're building bridges and roads and hospitals and schools. That's great. And they think that this is, uh, you know, this is the government helping. And in a sense, it is. But, you know, what economics does is that it teaches you to look at the seen and the unseen. And so the scene here is all these new hospitals and roads and bridges and whatever. But the unseen is the massive cost that went into them, which came from taxes. And it came from taxes from people who earned that money and could have spent it themselves. And so there's a very high opportunity cost to it. Now, the point of international lending institutions is to make you think that that opportunity cost doesn't exist because they finance it. But of course, you're going to pay for it in the future. Over time, you're going to have to pay for it and you're going to have to pay for it in hard currency because you can't just borrow in your currency indefinitely. You need to borrow in dollars. And so these bills add up. And ultimately, you know, from, from, the, from an Austrian school perspective, I think there's no way that the uh, central planner who has tax dollars is able to allocate the money as efficiently as the entrepreneurs who make that money themselves and can spend it on the things that they want and invest in the things that they want. So what seems like it is the government is helping, the government is doing its best, usually ends up being the cause of the future problems. For me, I think I would much rather a government just that just doesn't do anything because even though that might not be politically popular, like why are you not doing anything? The reality is that I'm doing the best thing in that situation, which is that I'm letting you keep your money. And the fact that I'm not building all those projects means that you have money to go and invest and buy into the projects that you want. You know, you go and you have money now to spend it on hospitals. So hospitals can be built by the private sector. There's this bias that Ron McKenzie in economics puts in people's minds, wherein the private sector obviously can't afford to build hospitals. So we're just going to take the money from the private sector, give it to a government, and then magically that becomes free. That becomes a free hospital, as if we can just get hospitals on tap by simply laundering the private sector money through the government. And of course, the, the missing part in this puzzle is the inflation. The only way that you can complete these free hospitals is when your currency is destroyed. And that's, that's what it really comes down to. It's just sad to see the same story repeat all over the world, all the time. And it's, um, it's, it's almost inevitable under a democratic system because leaders need to be seen to be doing something. Yeah, you know, you know economics very well. I don't, I don't know anything about it at all, but you know, there's, I always wondered, the more I learned about Bitcoin and money is that, and you know, why don't these governments, they can, you know, the greatest chance of opportunity in the event of government is to be able to print its own money, right? Abraham Lincoln said that, right? Just print the money and put people to work. But then, you know, when you talk, when you say that, everyone's like, no, you can't, because if you print up all that money, it's going to be hyperinflation. We'll be buying bread with baskets of cash. I was worried, and I was like, yeah, that makes sense. But then I really started to learn about Bitcoin. I started to learn about what money is, and I, I really, you know, um, one of my favorite books about it, my, my most favorite book is uh, The Secrets of the Federal Reserve. I used this book in 1950, I think. He's the guy that broke the case on the whole thing. Quite the character he used this moment. Um, he wanted to be a fictional writer, and he went to a mental institution when he was a young man, found a guy named Ezra Pound, who was uh, the ghostwriter for everyone from Hemingway to Norman Volkoff to Virginia Woolf. And he wanted to teach him how to, you know, write fiction. And you, uh, Ezra gave him an assignment. Hey, go to the Congressional Library of Congress and teach me everything and find out everything you can about this Federal Reserve System. Well, Eustace did it. He broke the whole tale on that. And what I learned from that book and, and really like digging deep into this, what is the crux of monetary policy, right? Like, it was many of Amsterdam Rothschild that said, if you give me the control of the volume of money in an economy, I don't care who makes the laws, rough quote. And that's what I've come to see. You can correct me if I'm wrong here, say, if you're the expert. To me, it seems that the responsibility of every government 
with this great generative power they have to create, this balance. Being able to be creating all this money without any work being done will cause some inflation, as we're seeing during COVID. $8 trillion was created, unless people were working, right? But if a government creates all this money, like if, if there's this much money in circulation, say right here is the money, and there's all of this potential work, meaning unemployed youth that can be done, so there's an imbalance there. So they print up all this money and put all of these unemployed youths to work. How can there really be inflation at that point? Because there's actual work being done. They're going to have more money. They're going to want to buy things. To me, that seems like there's balance. If that, if, if that balance is maintained, there should be no inflation in a natural free flow system, a free market. But the problem is, is that there's all this money being created and everyone's still unemployed. There's less work being done. Those people are just taking that money and they're buying their stupid shit with it, running up the prices. It's like a double tax on the people and no one's put to work. So I would counter this argument that I always hear about, oh, we can't grab all this money, it'll cause hyperinflation. Well, not if you put actual people to work, if you create work and the work that balances out uh, money in circulation. No, you're not going to have inflation. You're going to have wealth. You're going to have a lot more stuff. A lot more stuff people want, a lot more stuff being built. You're going to have a bigger economy. And my you know, proof to that is history is that look at the 13 colonies. 13 colonies of America, what did they have? Colonial script. It was just paper cash, but it wasn't backed by gold or silver. It was backed just by the work of the people. And it was some hard freaking work. These were a bunch of dudes that got off boats and started chopping down trees. But it was said that the average colonialist in America had a better life than an aristocrat in France. And once King George found out about that, he called Benji over and he said, what's going on here? And Benjamin told him, he said, well, now we're going to give you a bit of money right now. It's banned by gold, don't you worry. It's the British pound and sterling. And then what happened? A year later, the 30 colonies economy completely went into the dumpster. 60% unemployment. Everyone was poor, out of work. And that's why we had a revolutionary war. It wasn't because the price of tea was too high, right? This is my knowledge on the topic. Please, brother, you're the expert here. What do you think of the problem? Um, I, I, I disagree with the idea that if you just print money and get people to work, then there won't be inflation because um, this is this is kind of a um, labor theory of value way of looking at uh, economics in which uh, people just uh, doing work results in value as if economic value is just produced as a simple function of work. So you work three hours, you make $50 worth of, uh, or $30, say, worth of labor because every hour of labor makes $10 of work. And so if we hire a million people for 10 hours each, we're going to get this much economic value produced. I don't believe that economics works like that. And from an Austrian perspective, it isn't. And the reason that uh, it doesn't, and the reason that it doesn't, so that these kind of interventions don't work is that what you need in order for there to be economic production is that you need to have things produced that are subjectively valuable for people uh, who buy them. So that's what it ultimately comes down to. Somebody needs to value the output. And so how do you get it so that, how do you make it that people produce things that are valuable for one another? I mean, there's really only one way to do it. Don't pay them with fake printed money or with tax money and have the only way that they can secure payment is to get payment willingly from others. Like that's, by definition, that's how you create value, is people willingly part money with it. So if you're, on the other hand, if you're going in and paying people regardless of what their output is, which is what happens when, you know, you have these kind of uh, programs where the government prints money and starts hiring people, or when the government taxes money and then hires people, and it's something that, you know, I think applies in any time, in any place. It's always the same. If you're getting money from taxes and then you take the taxes and you use them to buy things because the government decides that these things are important and people need to buy them, you're not going to be paying for economic value uh, because uh, that's not money that people would have paid for themselves. They wouldn't have paid for it willingly. So in order to create economic value, you need money to be paid willingly. 
And for that to happen, it, it's the exact opposite. You don't want to print money. You don't want to take taxes. And you want to keep money with people. And that then forces the workers to think in terms of how do I serve others? And this is, I think, one of the major impediments to capitalism spreading around the world. It's something I see in places like Egypt and really all over the world is people don't have this idea of work. People don't think of work as being a responsibility wherein you need to deliver something of value for others so that they can willingly pay you for it. People think of work as some kind of entitlement that I'm owed a job. You know, why doesn't the government provide me with a job? I think this is an enormously destructive mentality on an individual level, because if you Come apply from the perspective that I just, you know, if only the government would just print a bunch of money and hand it to me and give me a, the good job that I deserve because, you know, I have the amazing distinction of having been born. And so other people need to give me money. And regardless, they need to give me the money regardless of the quality of my output. I deserve it for me. If you have that mentality on an individual level, it's massively destructive because it doesn't force you to go out there and figure out how to serve others. And so it makes you unproductive. And then at a national level, on, on, on a societal level, on an aggregate level, it's also very destructive because uh, you end up with large numbers of people that don't want to work and just expect to be taken care of. And so I, I, I see that, is, that this kind of thinking is kind of prevalent in some of the people who will say, you know, who might oppose central banking, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's kind of the populist and kind of wrong-headed take on the problem of central banking. So it's it's not the problem that the central banking is printing money and handing it to banks per se. The problem is that they're just printing money, full stop. Nobody should be printing money and money should just be allocated by individuals themselves who produce them. So it's it should be so that money is hard to make, so that everybody goes out and works hard to figure out how to serve others so that they are able to make money. It's... It, it, it's uh, it's destructive to print money and hand it to banks. It's destructive to print money and hand it to workers. The, dis the printing of money itself is the problem. And uh, the I think a, a part of these ideas are also counterproductive because they essentially, they act as a kind of trap for populist supporters. In other words, you know that something is wrong. And this sounds like an interesting, attractive idea. Hey, if they just print money and give it to us, then we'd all be rich and it wouldn't just be the bankers who are rich. And so what does that make you do? It makes you support money printing. Well, then who's going to be the one in charge of the money printing is not going to be you. It's not going to be the poor people who are going to benefit from it. So you give in your consent to money printing. You vote for the people who want to have central banks. You support the notion of having a central bank and you support the notion of inflationary money. And that ends up being obviously used. You know, you can't just give inflationary money to everybody that just defeats the purpose. It's going to inevitably be used to the benefit of some people at the expense of others. And of course, the people that are best equipped to take advantage of it are usually the people who can dedicate most resources to taking advantage of it. So this kind of perspective can be a little bit of a trap. I think the world needs hard money. It doesn't need more money. Congratulations, man. You just shit all over my life. I'm still active, girl. I hate you. <laughs> Sorry, I was still active. Sorry, my bad. That's a bad job. <laughs> no, but you brought up a lot of great points, brother. So, uh, number one, the fiat standard has corrupted people's mindsets about work. It's made people lazy, entitled. You know, there was a certain flappiness there to the mentality of the workers, right? That has to be fought against. This is a recent development. It wasn't like this in the 15th, right? That's a problem. It's a, it's a surmountable problem. I'm confident of that. But the other thing is what you mentioned in the beginning, right? Like, yes, you have to make sure that the work people are doing will actually increase the, to like the greatest, the, the potential capacity of more work to be done, like more infrastructure, better roads better you know, places for factories to build up, increasing the total potential of the work that can be done of the entire population, making things easier, right? How that manifests could be, you know, industrial zones, better infrastructure, et cetera. You saw that in the New Deal, right? I'm not an expert on that. But I know, I, I know from studying history 
that incredible transformations are possible. Should there be leadership, as Cicero said, enlightened leader, what could be more glorious, that does things the right way? The problem is in this world, we have no guarantee of that. And should any of those such leaders rise up, they are having to take to the head of this community completely chopped off. So I understand your perspective. It just, you know, it would have to be a perfect storm for that to happen at the actually world. There has to be an enlightened leader there that could not be bought. He would absolutely, or she would have to survive. And the people would have to buy in to all of this. There's very, very few times in recent history where that's happened. So I understand your perspective. Absolutely. I believe that though with that perfect storm, that humanity is capable of doing amazing things in a very short amount of time. And that's the magic that we were created with by the creator, right? Should a bunch of humans get together and be able to unleash their full potential with an honest system of money, the result can be complete transformation in less than a decade. I firmly do believe that. that. Even though you don't. <laughs> no, but thank you. This is a very, very useful perspective you gave, brother. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's very common to to see these ideas, but uh, in reality, it shouldn't really matter much because, like, you, you're a solution-oriented person, and the solution is the same. Uh, Bitcoin is not going to allow us to uh, have that kind of money printer anyway. So, that uh, that's taking care of that. Like, uh, ultimately, intellectual debates on these questions don't matter much compared to actions, and you are a man of action, so don't stress the intellectual arguments too much because ultimately they don't matter. Uh, what matters is people in Nigeria and Egypt picking up all these um, Bitcoins. And and this is, this is, for me, what is so beautiful about Bitcoin because historically, trying to reason with people on economics is a very difficult thing. Economics is extremely counterintuitive. It's extremely susceptible to this bias of, hey, I just want to do good, so I'm going to translate my intentions into actions and expect the consequences to follow my intentions. But understanding that economics is not, you're not dealing with inanimate objects, you're dealing with human beings with a will, and therefore that all the actions that are taken coercively result in a, a, a reaction by the people that uh, take part in them makes this a lot more complicated. It's very difficult to get people to, to, to understand this on a large scale. And in fact, if you look at the times in which you've had prosperity under a kind of a free market system, it didn't really happen because the world was full of people who studied uh, classical liberal economic ideals. It didn't happen because people considered, you know, let's think of the alternatives and let's follow the one that is the most uh, free market friendly uh, because they were educated by uh, good economists. It sort of just happened at a time when, because it, it just happened because it's just the normal natural order of things. And it takes a lot of misinformation, a lot of bad economics in order to get people to start supporting inflationary and um, interventionist ideas. But once these interventionist and inflationary ideas begin to spread, it's like a genie that can't be put back in the bottle. That because they lay the groundwork for their own perpetuation. So you start off with, let's print money to do this, and then we keep printing more and more money, and then that creates more problems. So if you got in, into the mental framework that fixing money, uh, printing money fixes problems, then you just keep creating more problems, and you just keep seeing the creation of more problems as the justification for printing more money. And so you get stuck in this forever cycle of more interventions just creates more problems, more problems lead to the call for more interventions. And it's just very difficult to break out of it. And I think historically, if you look at the examples where this kind of, uh, where society has managed to break out of this, it, it, it doesn't sadly happen too often that it just, uh, th that people reverse course. Uh, the interventionist path has to be taken all the way until it's a dead end. And then out of the ashes of whatever is left, a new system emerges. And then that system is just not capable of being as restrictive as the first previous one. So think of the example of Germany. You know, you had the Weimar Republic and then the Nazi regime. Both went extremely in uh, the direction of controlling economic activity and centralizing economic direction. 
And then yeah, th there was no reform for that. Like there was no point at which you could have just went back and had a free market economy. There was no fixing that. But once the war was over and the new German government took over, and this is a fascinating story that I always like to mention, uh, Ludwig Erhard, uh, who was the minister of the economy in Germany, just went ahead and decided, you know what? We're not going to have any price controls. We're just not going to do price controls. And one day he just went on the radio and he said, no more price controls. Even though the American administrators at that time, they thought price controls would be the best thing to do. It was what was being done all over Europe. It was still being done in the US, all over the world. But this guy just went and said, no, we don't want price controls. And it unleashed the German miracle. But, you know, decades later, that system itself then gathered an enormous amount of interventions. So now we see that the German economy has an enormous amount of interventions and it's beginning to get more and more paralyzed, both from the monetary interventions and the fiscal interventions. So it's um, it's a thankless task, all of which is a very long way to, to go back to the same conclusion to pretty much everything that we ever discussed on this podcast, which is that Bitcoin fixes this. Because Bitcoin is that new regime wherein we don't need to go and convince people. We don't need to go and convince people to, no, you need to support free market economics. You can continue to support the fiat system, and the fiat system is just going to continue to give you more of the same fiat outputs. But you can upgrade and go to the Bitcoin system, and then you'll get to experience an entirely different world, an entirely different set of economic incentives. You're going to get me in trouble, brother. You're going to get me in so much trouble. Oh, why? I'll be waiting to pop out right now, bro. You almost triggered me or something. That, oh, my God. That can only be, that can only be reserved for an in-person discussion, my good man. We shall have to veer off momentarily, sir. But rest assured, I have a question for you. Is this? Were you, say for the animals, put in charge of an Asian? Right? You're the president. You're in complete control. You've got the military backing you up. You're good. Your job is to transform this nation and work a miracle in just four short years. What is your plan, sir? It's a really very simple plan. I would shut down the government bureaucracy, all of it. I would just simply shut down all the ministries. There's no more Ministry of Agriculture. Um, agriculture, a complete separation of state and agriculture. So just let... If you want to grow whatever you want to grow, grow it. And if you want to sell it, sell it for whatever price you want. No government intervention into the production of food. No government intervention into any markets. I'd shut down all of these bureaucracies. And I mean, this is the tricky part. Uh, obviously, politically, it's going to be extremely unpopular because the public sector is extremely politically powerful. But you said I have full backing, so I can do whatever I want. So I would shut down the public sector there. And I would slash taxes massively, basically destroy completely taxes because you know, get rid of 90% of government spending and 90% of government revenue and uh, replace the central bank with Bitcoin. Well, even if Bitcoin was not there, let's make this a little bit more interesting and say that there, there was no Bitcoin. Imagine you're asking me this question in 2007. Still, uh, what I do is I take away the ability of the banking system and the central bank to create more money. Um, if I could go back on a gold standard, I'd do that. might be a bit tricky because, you know, the IMF doesn't like you to go on a gold standard. But I'd have it done in a way, uh, I'd have the central bank function in a way where it just simply clears payments between banks uh, nationally and internationally. And it is not able to issue more money. And it is, does not allow the banks to issue all more money because it doesn't back them up. And so banks ended up having to have a full reserve. And so you kill inflation, you kill taxation, and then just do nothing. And, you know, I just simply do nothing. Like I focus on uh, working out and uh, grilling steak and uh, getting out of people's way, not taking money out of people. I'd, like for me, the ideal president is the president who's just leaves people alone. The, the ideal president is somebody who's just not taking money from people and not telling them what to do with their lives. And I'm very confident that this would outperform any other kind of uh, government uh, plan. Okay. So let me add a few more ingredients to this question. Let's assume you don't have any gold. Let's assume you have very few natural resources. Your only real natural resource is the people. 
and the work that they can do. Let's also assume that you are being watched by foreign powers that want your experiment to fail, and they will throw every possible monkey wrench into your plans possible, including the kind of war on you, should you be successful. How does that change your plan in any way? Yeah, I mean, well, that changes my plan because that's why people like me don't get into power in the first place. Like, you don't need to declare a war. That's just, it's much easier to just stop these people. Um, I mean, it's the job is made in a sense of where you know, the only way you can get into that job is that you need to have a statist mindset. So this is why people like this don't get into power. It's if, if it, you do get somebody like this, it's a, some freak of nature, but you know, like Germany after World War II, where they just happened to pick a guy, the Americans picked the guy and the guy just turned out and said, turned around and said, you know what, let's not do price controls. It could be an enlightened monarch, a king who's been in power for decades and uh, centuries. And generally, I think kings have this kind of mentality. A lot of kings have realized this because, you know, they, their family's been in power for centuries. They teach themselves and their children important lessons. And I think you will have figured this out. If you've been doing the governance business for centuries, you realize that the best form of government is the government that does the least. So. You look at uh, monarchs in general, they do a lot less than presidents. Okay. The, the, there's a lot less aggressive uh, economic planning and a lot less aggressive taxation, a lot less inflation under monarchies than under republics. So yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to see this situation happening. That's why you're, uh, it's useful as a kind of illustration of what I think, but <laughs> if it comes, if it comes to actual, uh, implementation, then the whole entire thought experiment falls apart because it's not happening. I do this thought experiment every night, brother. Every single night, man. I ask myself that question. What can I do right now to mount some serious resistance? What are the best pieces to work with, meaning humans? And where can we stake our battle? Where can we plant that flag? I see Nigeria as ground zero for this world revolution. I look at that country, and yes, there are many natural resources in the ground, but by and large, it's the youth. They are the most powerful, right? Natural resources that Nigeria has. I think the most powerful youth population in the world, quite frankly. So looking at this place, me, I am a free creature. I just want to fuck this darkness up. The supremacist mind control virus that has poisoned the entire world is my enemy. No human is my enemy. I love all of God creatures, especially humans. They really rub me the wrong way sometimes. I'm like hermit, but I love humans. And I want to fuck this virus up. So I've chosen a battleground. I believe Africa is the place to start. I believe it will be the last free place on earth. I believe then in less than a decade, should we get the right pieces together, we can transform the entire the eastern uh, horn of Africa, uh, sub-horn, all the way from Ivory Coast to Nigeria, which is already the most urbanized area in the world, I believe we can transform it and it'll look just like Dubai, if not better. Question is how to do that. So there's a lot of secretarian issues, ecclesiastical issues, there's a lot of issues within the country. However, if the youth population, armed with Bitcoin, peer to peer electronic cash, they can make money through arbitrage, right? Arbitrage is a magical thing where these people can solve problems for others and make profit from their own homes. I've seen this experiment pan out with Parksville for the past seven years. It's great. And it's an army of mosquitoes, right? Can't stop an army of mosquitoes, but they can cut the head off any one person quite easily, including myself, which is why I am on this crusade to decentralize Parksville in the coming years. I believe that the first component of a truly free market is, of course, a free payment system. You can't have a free market without free payments. And I believe with a free market, something amazing happens. When God made our human beings, he made us with some special magic. You remember that story where God created Adam and the angels look at this and they're like, yeah, you made another one of these things with ego and free will, huh? How do you know it's not going to go like the last time? And his answer was, I know what you know not. 
I don't know exactly what that answer is. Only God knows, but humans have an amazing ability that when we work together and we're able to transact our value on a global scale, amazing things happen, right? Wealth is created. That is the promise of a truly free market. So I believe that giving these arbitrage traders an unstoppable platform to continue their trading and to open up corridors all across the world and even just within Africa is a huge step in this direction. This will get things to be freed up. This will have more money in the hands of the people, us plebs. And we can begin the process of taking the system back. That includes lobbying. That includes us getting more involved. That includes creating a cell of humans that cannot be bought. That they can mount a real tactical resistance over time. That is the current reality. Now, if I were to get in there and I had complete power to transform a country, man, I'd go full freak of nature, bro. I would, yes, I would create money and the money would be created as work is done. I put all these youth to work, you know, building up the infrastructure of the company, rules, wells, schools, factories, all of that. Now, of course, that's a weak plan because it depends on one human being. I would be a weak link in that case. That's where it falls apart, right? Because it's not just me being killed or anyone being killed. It's all the forces of darkness marshaling on this one person. That's why that, that plan is weak. But I believe if you do have a leader like that, they can be protected. That has the buy-in of the people. That will rapidly accelerate the entire plan. Now, that's just wishful thinking. Because no one wants to be in the line of fire of the whole Antichrist system that we have right now. Very few humans can handle that. We'll have to wait until the return of the son of Mary, before we have someone that can handle that kind of thing. But I myself do have a plan, brother. And that's why I need people like you. I need guy pens on this plan. I'm not an economist. I'm not some brilliant person on all levels of human understanding. No, I'm just one believer that's trying to be guided here. I see real opportunity as an entrepreneur. And I believe we can work a miracle in Africa over these next seven years. That miracle will reverberate across the entire world. It's a crazy and tricky plan, I know. But it's not just a dream. We already have a start. This money is already flowing, and money is the key. I don't believe in Bitcoin just being hoarded as a store of value. We have to make the little sats flow. So as I continue forward on this plan, I have a few ideas. One of them is a UBI. Now I'm not a socialist. Definitely sure there's not a lot of communists. You know that about me. But I believe we can issue a universal Bitcoin income to people in the form of sats. And it's not going to be much money. It can just be a bunch of dust. But the point is, we can have a billion youth across the global south in possession of some kind of Bitcoin. And through that effect, if we get them to use it on a daily basis, they will become much more familiar with it. And we'll eventually enter into the realm of arbitrage, which is very powerful. Now, to elucidate on this example, I will give you an example of arbitrage and how it's used by the central powers. For example, in Nigeria, there is something called the round tripping, where the friends of the central bank are allowed to buy dollars at the official price. And then they will take those dollars and sell them on the back market at double the price. And then just rinse and repeat, they make billions this way. Now, the real corruption here is that it is in the interest of these people that have this round tripping arbitrage method for the spread to be as high as possible. So they don't want to stabilize the economy. And eventually that leads the whole economy into ruin. It will get poorer and poorer because of this round tripping, because the elites in this position don't want this problem to be fixed. This is why in the 80s, one naira was worth more than a dollar. And now it's what, almost 900 to one? And that's why they cracked down so hard at a Nigerian Because they're like, like, hey, only we can explore this magical arbitrage shit. All you peer, peer traders out there trying to do the same thing that we're doing, we're not going to allow that to happen. But I want to allow that to happen. I want to make it unstoppable. And I believe we have all the tools and components we need to do this now. The internet, proliferation of mobile phones, and Bitcoin. And it's my job to give them all the plug they need to be able to do this safely. To do so, I've incorporated riled out for taking of real rebellious mutants, freaks of nature. 
I believe you're one of them, brother. You certainly are. I look up to you, brother. You have a lot of knowledge. Your two books alone, they would be the canon of Mendry Central School that I put together. I already have 12 schools in Africa. So I dream set up a school for gifted children as well. X-Men style, Professor Xavier style, except I can walk and I still have a fro. I'll stop talking now, brother. I just had to unleash that on you. You inspired me. But please, brother, don't go down that other path you started. Otherwise, you're going to unleash something horrible. Sure. Well, I mean, let me um, offer a little bit of a, a counterpoint or maybe some kind of a... Let me, be, let me rain on your parade, if you'll allow me. Let me be the negative Nancy here. I think I'll invite you to consider the idea that what you view as the forces of darkness is, in fact, people who started out thinking of what you wanted to do and then ended up creating all these horrific systems that become very, very oppressive. So like you said, you know, what you want to do is you want to print money and you want to hand out money to people. And then in the same breath, you moved on to discuss how the Naira exchange rate is uh, manipulated by the government and the, so the people who are connected to the regime are able to get the uh, currency at a better rate and then they just flip it on the market for double the rate and they make money from just trading that. These two things, the thing you want and the thing that you're fighting, they're the face, they're two faces of the same coin. In other words, if you were in charge of Egypt tomorrow and you were in a position where you could go and print uh, Egyptian pounds and give it to people and start uh, hiring them to do things, immediately you're going to cause the price of the pound to drop compared to the US dollar. And so then that's just, you know, immediately you, you realize it's like you're running on a treadmill. You're trying to get somewhere, but you're on a treadmill. The faster you run, the faster the treadmill goes and you don't move anywhere. So the more money you print, the more you think you're getting things done because you're paying people, but the people are just getting money that's worthless. And so because the value of the money is declining. So then it's inevitable at that point. I remember I was saying the dynamic of monetary intervention and then leading to more interventions. Inevitably, at that point, you're going to want to find a way of stopping the uh, Egyptian pound from devaluing next to the dollar. And so how did you do that? Well, you used to say there's an official exchange rate and that you're not allowed to exchange things uh, at the other prices. So you're only allowed to get, you're only allowed to sell the, say, the Egyptian pound that Let's say 10. So, but the black market rate is 20. So, if one dollar gets you 10 pounds, 10 uh, Egyptian pounds from the government, but on the black market, you need you would get 20 pounds for it. So, in this kind of world, who's going to be able to buy dollars? Well, everybody would want to get dollars for 10 pounds from the government. So, clearly, the government can't give everybody 10 pounds for the dollar because they don't have enough dollars. Or, or they can't give everybody a dollar for 10 pounds because they don't have enough dollars to do that. So they're going to have to restrict the number of people that are getting the dollars. And so that then leads to exactly the situation that you have in Nigeria. Where some people are able to get the dollars at the government uh, rate. Everybody else has to buy it on the black market. And so the people who get it are just given an easy 50% uh, an easy 100% return, just if, if you happen to be one of the people that is connected. And now you throw in the fact that we're not in a world in which you manage to magically wave a wand and be in charge and completely politically secure. You are in a political environment where you're trying to stay in power, and so you need supporters. And so who are the people that are going to be getting the beneficial treatment, who are going to be getting the special right to access the window or currency exchange? It's going to be your political allies, and you need to give them this so that they continue to support you. And so now we go back to the same political arrangement, wherein you have somebody in powers, and then you have them using the government in order to buy supporters. And so you're printing money, you're taking people out of the productive labor force from serving each other and trying to satisfy each other to give each other things that are valuable enough for them to pay for them up front, for them to pay for them in cash, you know, from hard earned money and you're taking them out of the productive sector and putting them in the public sector where you're just paying them regardless of what they produce because it feels right and you're destroying the value of the currency and you're destroying the foreign exchange market and you're just laying the groundwork for another way 
to get radicalized by your actions and um, come and want to tear this entire thing down. And this, I think, is, is a great way of understanding the, uh, the tragedy of uh, the developing world uh, under the fiat system, which is you go from one heavily interventionist government to another, and they're not all just evil people out there looking to do evil things. A lot of them are just... Really, they start off thinking, I'm just trying to fix things. But I think there's no government like no government. The best government is no government. It's just get out of people's way, and let them keep their money, and let them spend their money. That's all that anybody ever needs. This is, this is how uh, rich societies all over the world have emerged. Damn, you're right, bro. But I'll have you know, my good man, it wasn't the very same breath. It was the second breath. This conversation is recorded, mind you. Okay, so you made some great points there. <laughs> right all over my bread. Didn't even sugarcoat a bit. Typical safe Fedeen style. Plus, for that. <laughs> so, you made a great point. Now, I have a question, another question. Mm-hmm. Inflation that's coming. It is. If outside forces were not in control, and if it was just this one economy, would there really be inflation? I would argue that there wouldn't if there was the actual work being done and the work was leading to the potential of more work and more creative opportunities. I believe the inflation is happening because of an external attack, because price discovery is in the hands of this maniacal, corrupted cabal. And I believe this entity definitely exists. Yes, they do incentivize their workers and their workers can be billionaires, but there is a deep, like demonic force, anti-human force at work here. And they control price discovery. And that's the problem. Ultimately, we need to take this away from them. When there is an alternative to this Forex that can be subverted with a few paper shorts every morning on the Forex, and we see that very clearly with the price of gold and silver, artificially suppressed for a very long time, as long as they have this, they can hurt us. And they're hurting the cloud and global south. There is a path to taking this away from them. But I need seven years. I believe that peer-to-peer price of Bitcoin in every market is the real street price. And the stronger that grows to prominence, we will have an alternative backed up by real trade, not wash trades on Binance or Durabit or whatever, but real human interaction. This peer-to-peer street price, I believe, has to be brought to prominence. Once this thing is, exists and it is respected, we will have an alternative, and they won't have the sort that they have right now. I mean, I think um, ultimately... It's going to be nice, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be nice. Ultimately, inflation is just an increase in the money supply. And so if you have a way of making more money, that way is going to be exploited. Eventually, people are going to find a way of making more of it. And like the forces pushing for money printing... Everybody, like everybody is convinced that money printing is good, especially if it goes to their own pet causes. And so, I mean, clearly large financial institutions benefit from it. Clearly large corporations benefit from it. Clearly, uh, but but they're not the only ones. You know, the workers want higher salaries and better pay and they want the government to uh, subsidize things for them and people want the government to subsidize products that they buy. They, people want free health care. People want um, military that uh, looks good on TV and uh, they want to spend a lot of money on all of that, that stuff. People want a lot of things and fiat sells them the illusion that you can have them at no cost. And so that that's the problem. That's really the root of the problem. We can point fingers at specific individuals and specific people and specific organizations, but ultimately as long as we're in that game where we think we want more money in order to fix our problems, then we're we're as guilty as they are effectively because it's all pushing in the same direction. I mean, well, as guilty as they are is probably complicated. Guilt is is a complex thing, but it's, it's ultimately about inflationism. And this is why I think Bitcoin is just so extremely powerful because it ends this discussion because it just forces everybody to come to terms with the fact that 
look, you can make your own money and you can print from it as much as you want. But as long as everybody in the world is able to access Bitcoin and Bitcoin is uncensored and Bitcoin operates without censorship and without being, um, without being subject to political control, then everybody can escape this. And I think, look at the, uh, you know, to go back to the example of developing country leaders, you know, all of these developing country leaders who had all these grand ideas about things that they want to do with their countries that involve printing money and handing it out and uh, doing all kinds of things and taking on loans, they themselves, they would send their kids to go to school in Switzerland and they would put their life savings in Swiss banks. They would take the money that they pillage from their government and from their people, and they would move it to Swiss Bank when Switzerland was on the gold standard, when Switzerland had the safest banks in the world. So everybody wants easy money for everybody else, and they, you know, this is this is basically how everybody rationalizes it. This is in to, to a large extent, this is the sum of economic knowledge for most people, which is here are the reasons why. We should, everybody should use this money that will be printed to meet my desires, Why? whereas I need to use the harder money. So, you know, in a place like Lebanon, the people who are, the people who benefit from the lira, they want the lira to continue. They want the currency to continue to be printed. They want everybody to use the lira. They want the lira back, but they still will want their Swiss bank account to be in dollars and Swiss francs and the euros and all these other currencies. You know, so it's easy money for you, hard money for me is, is the motto for everybody. And the reason this, I think, continues and subsists so strongly is because we have no alternative in the fiat system. You have to, you have to use your local fiat coin, and Bitcoin just changed that. So if you could take over Lebanon tomorrow, a country who's suffered tremendously, right, and just recently, what would you do? What would be the first thing that you? I'd close down the central bank, just shut it down completely, and uh, allow anybody to open any bank in any currency that they want, and have a free market in banking where I don't uh, get to tell anybody what they want, and then people are free to bank with whoever they want, and uh, I think that would just lead to the dollarization of the economy. The majority of banks will just function with dollars, and the. Uh, day-to-day -day money will be done with dollars. And then if you do that, uh, then the government is going to have to sort itself out in a way that is, you know, the government is just going to stop being able to pay its bills. And so then if to the extent that any government is going to exist, it's going to have to be fiscally and monetarily responsible. So it can't print money. And then it just needs to spend less than it earns. It needs to find a way to tax people less than it turns. That would involve reducing the size of the bureaucracy enormously. That's that's it. Like for me, there there is no giant thing that you can do in power in order to make the economy magically revive. You can just stop stealing from people. That's that's the big thing. The big thing is to just do nothing. That's the secret really to having a successful society economically is to just allow people to keep the fruits of their labor and to spend it themselves. If there's not enough dollars in the economy, if it be a massively deflationary situation, right? How is everyone going to be employed and paid if there's very few dollars in the economy? There's always enough dollars in the economy. It doesn't matter what the number of dollars is. The number of dollars is just uh, whatever money we have right now. But you know, you work, you produce, you generate more value. People will export things. Expats will send remittances. Or what you do when you get rid of the lira is that you get rid of the ability of the government to finance its spending by taking people's savings. And then you just replace that. Obviously, the dollar is not ideal because you're uh, still getting US dollar inflation. And But it is ideal because at least you're not, being, you're not financing the government for local people's wealth. So... Yes, people are getting robbed, but they're getting robbed on their dollars a lot less than they were to be getting robbed from the lira, which, you know, the dollar is devaluing by 5 10% per year or so. So it's much better in that regard that you're only getting robbed to that extent. But ideally, of course, I'd like people to move to Bitcoin. I think initially what would happen is dollarization, but I think over time, the same thing that happened between the lira and the dollar would happen between the dollar and Bitcoin, and eventually we'd get Bitcoinization. 
Okay. So then the second thing you do is you have to get more FX into the country. You know, cutting Western Union out of it so more dollars can come in. But really, you need to get as much Bitcoin into the economy as possible so that there's enough stats to go around for people to work, right? For all the potential work that can be done, that's what you need. No, because no, because this kind of assumes like we need a certain supply of satoshis or dollars in order for the economy to work as if it's like fuel for an engine, you know, an engine, you need to put in a certain amount of fuel in order for it to burn. But the money is not the fuel of, a, 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 of economic activity. Money is just a medium for exchanging the products of economic activity. It's, it's not the thing that creates the economic activity. You can't eat money. You can't eat satoshis. You can't eat dollars. It doesn't have value as a consumer good to us. And so therefore, whatever amount of money is present in any economy is enough as it is. And then prices adjust to the monetary reality. Essentially, this is the reality. Like, yeah, would it be better if we could get everybody in Lebanon a million dollars? Of course, it would be even better if we could get everybody in Lebanon $2 million. Uh, but it doesn't. Uh, that's not realistic. Realistically, what people need is the ability to use a form of money that doesn't rob them and to be able to plan economic activity around it. And then once you tap that, you get economic activity reviving, people are able to work, and then people can um, meet their needs. Yes. Okay. Agreed. So I think that the analogy of fuel is, is not a good one. You're right. It's not consumable good, right? What makes more sense is blood. The circulatory system, if you compare an economy to a human body, to me, it makes sense that money is the blood. It's what's flowing around and restoring cells and, and moving things around, waste, recycling, et cetera. In my body or in your body, let's say I have optimally eight liters of blood, then I can function properly, right? If I go down to do one liter of blood, I'm going to be in shock. My skin is going to be white and I'm going to be incapacitated. If I have 20 liters of blood, heart failure almost immediate, right? And that's my point about the balance. Now, not everyone needs a million dollars, of course. They don't even need a thousand dollars. Their salary, they could be a hundred dollars. It could be ten dollars and they could be playing with cents. That's fine. But as long as there is enough for the body to function, this is. But the problem, right? I, I'm not an economist. I don't know how much money. No, I, 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 I disagree with this analogy. And I'm sorry to be so uh, disagreeable, but you know, you signed up for this. <laughs> it's uh, that, like the, the difference is there is an amount of blood that your body needs in order to function. If you lose too much blood, you die. And there is an amount of blood that there is such a thing as too much blood. Like if you have too much blood in your body, you'll die. But there is no such thing for money. Like you could run the entire world economy on this monthly supply of one US dollar or one quadrillion US dollars or a hundred trillion dollars. It does not matter because the quantity itself is irrelevant because money is not a good that satisfies us as a consumer good itself. Its only role is to be exchanged for other things. And so therefore, its quantity does not matter. What matters is its purchasing power. That's what makes it different from uh, blood. You need a certain amount of blood, but you don't need a certain amount of money to run the economy. You could have the entire world economy run on the current money supply of, let's say, around $100 trillion. But if we took out a hundred, if you took out two zeros from all the world's money, and then the $100 bill became a $1 bill, we could bring down the global money supply to 1 trillion and nothing changes. We just exchange the name of the $100 bill to a $1 bill and then the $1 bill becomes a cent. And the world economy continues to function exactly normally. They did something like that in Turkey, I think it around the year 2001 or so. They had gotten to a point where one US dollar was worth one and a half million Turkish liras. So they decided, let's just take six zeros out. And so the money supply went down by a millionth, but by a million fold. So the money supply was a millionth of what it was overnight. Uh, you can't do that with your blood. So this is the difference. So this is why uh, the focus on money is really kind of distracting from the reality of economic activity. What matters are the 
products that people produce. This is what people want. People don't want money for its own sake. So, you know, there's a reason why if I asked you, would you rather have one dollar or ten thousand Lebanese liras? You would choose one dollar, even though there's a lot more Lebanese liras, because in terms of purchasing power, ten thousand Lebanese liras are worth less than a fifth of a dollar, right? So it's not the quantity that matters; it's the purchasing power. And the purchasing power will adjust to economic reality, whatever the distribution of the money. So you don't need to redistribute money. You don't need to make more money. You don't need to give people more money. Just need to let people look at the money as it is and then start planning their economic activity around it. In other words, it's not like blood. It's much closer to the inch or the meat or the centimeter. It's a unit that we use as a reference point for uh, making calculations. And so it's not, it, we don't need to make the meter larger so that people can build taller buildings. We just need to have a fixed meter that everybody agrees upon, that everybody knows that all the engineers can build according to, so that when you order a door that is two meter high, you get exactly a door that fits where you need it to fit. We don't need to expand or contract the meter for that. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how much the meter is. It could be, you know, this could be the meter or this could be the meter. It doesn't matter. It could be small, it could be large. As long as we all stick to it and we all agree to it and we all understand it and it is intersubjectively constant between us that when you tell me I want a two meter door, I deliver the exact size of the door that you expect. That's all that we need. So this is why it's not an issue of making more money it's not an issue of printing money and it's this is why i don't see the answer to be in having you know right leaders come in and do the right things with money it's about just having leaders stop messing with people's money you know this analogy was all that i had man my entire army theory rested on that he just took it right away man that candy from the baby what's wrong with you man that got a little hard man Hey, listen, it's better that I take it away from you right now than life takes it away. Like, you know, if this is bad candy for you, you're much better off your dad taking it from you and making you cry as a child and then you not getting addicted to candy rather than, you know, your doctor having to take it from you or, you know, have to do all kinds of horrible things for you as a consequence 30 years later. So the small pains can save us many large pains. <laughs> You're a savage, bro. So <laughs> the point that you made was good. You know, this tally stake system in England, right? Before Oliver Cromwell came in and messed things up, it was a bunch of wooden sticks right, that they used to, as a ledger. And it worked. So humans can agree on nearly any system of money, right? So no, the rules for that, again, I'm not a economist. I would defer to you from that, but I'm ready to cry right now. But I have one more question. Yeah. Yeah. What well, third step you would take on place like Lebanon? How would you use Bitcoin in there in a way that's better than El Salvador? You know, the inflows, the outflows, the off ramps, saturation, all of that. Do you have a plan there? Um, I also kind of think, I mean, I, I can't come up with anything better than what you guys are doing with Paxful. I think this is it. Like, if I, if I had the resources, I'd just... Uh, I'd set up a liquid market for people to buy and sell. That's it. Like, I, I don't think there's anything better that you can do. Uh, like, if I was enormously rich, maybe I'll give people Bitcoin to get them started. But I don't really see that as being very wise because if you give people free, if you give people something for free and they, they don't ask for it, they're not giving anything up in order to get it, then you know, one of two things is going to happen. They're going to lose it or not care about it, or they're going to just trade it in for money. You know, they realize, oh, wow, I can just take this and uh, exchange it for uh, actual money that I think of as money, or I could just go and buy myself food for the day with this amount of money that you gave me. So most of them are just going to go and spend it. So it's going to be a one-off thing. So I, I would not necessarily want to give away a lot of money, even if it was affordable for me, like if I had an enormous wealth, I don't see it as being very effective. I think in order for people to get Bitcoin, they need to want it themselves. So it's just not something that can be imposed on them top down. And I think for that to happen, 
what needs to happen is people need to understand the value proposition in terms of the fact that this thing is not easy to inflate. So therefore, its value is expected to go up. And they need to start accumulating cash balances. And most likely for the vast majority of people, it's going to start with a small cash balance. You know, you have 1% of your net worth in Bitcoin. And then over time, as your conviction increases and as Bitcoin performs well, that cash balance continues to grow. And so it becomes a bigger and bigger chunk of your net worth. And once we have large numbers of people that have significant amounts of their wealth in this uh, money, Bitcoin, then you're going to start seeing more and more transactions taking place. So I don't have any kind of magic pill solution. I wouldn't bet on any of these things happening. I would just let the market do its thing. I think the best thing that you could do is, yeah, just I'd, I'd be a market maker. You know, I'd have a big stash of Bitcoin that I would use to buy and sell for people and give them low fees so that there are small premiums. And that, that's really the best thing that you can do because uh, ultimately, once people are ready to buy, the less uh, fees they pay, the more Bitcoin they have, the bigger their cash balances. So the most effective thing that you can do is set up a very good business that allows people to buy Bitcoin at low fees. And so I think that's what's so great about Paxful. So your actions are better than my words. And let's put it this way. So I, I may come and uh, mock all of your ideas and uh, walk all over them, but your actions have gotten more people into Bitcoin than my word, likely. So that, that that's what I think would happen. And I think over time, if Bitcoin works, then Bitcoin continues to appreciate. And then that, that leads to cash balances increasing and Bitcoin becoming increasingly more uh, used. And eventually, I would believe it would take over monetarily. But it's not something that I believe I can uh, just bring about with a press of a button. Finally, after whooping on my ass for two hours, you give me a little look. You have a heart after all. Although I see you're not a fan of that welfare check. That welfare check comes in handy sometimes. All right. Yeah, but, well, I mean, yeah, the, the, the other question is, well, how, how are you going to get all those Satoshis? Where are you going to get all those Satoshis to handle the people? Like, I mean, a country like Nigeria is 220 million people. If you're going to give everybody a dollar a month, that's 220 million dollars a month. That's a lot of money. So in a year, that's about $3 billion or so. So how are you going to get $3 billion a year? And that's just $1 a month, which is very, very little money. So then imagine if you wanted to give everybody $10 a month, that's, you know, the richest person in the world would run out of that money in very, very short order. So obviously, as somebody who's in the position to give money to Nigerians, your only way of getting that money is getting it from Nigerians. So why don't we cut out the middleman and just let them keep the money instead of taking it from them and redistributing it? Well, my good man, I must agree. And I must point you to a magical, technical aspect of Bitcoin called Satoshis. There's 100 million Satoshis in a Bitcoin. So my plan is hundred of my own Bitcoin, that's 10 billion Satoshis. And to throw that out to the people of Nigeria over a period of about 18 months. Now, of course, it's not a lot of money, right? But as long as they have, like you said, it's not the amount of money, it's this virtual power, which will increase over time. But before we continue on this angle, let's flash back like a man to 11 years ago. I was homeless. I was sitting on a bench. And in front of the V, was the Council of Foreign Affairs on 89th Street Elections in Avenue in New York City. And as I was there, munching on some Domino's pizza crust at the bottom of the rubbish bin, I was thinking about what goes on in there. Now, by this time, I'd already consumed quite a bit of literature by the architects that dwell inside that place. These were the architects of World War I, World War II, and they remained to be the architects of everything that we're seeing happening in the world. Names like the big new Brzezinski, Between Two Ages, a book he wrote in 1969, I believe. And he does an amazing job of predicting everything that's happening now. As I sat there, I began to wonder. Yes, I've been reading their books. And when you read books, you have an ability to channel how people could think. Uh, I've been continuing to do so over the past 11 years, and I feel I have an understanding of how these architects think. Now, I'll put ourselves in modern day. Sit many seas are coming. They're already here. They've already happened in Nigeria. So lo, I like to do an experiment where I put myself in one of the shoes of one of these architects. Let's say it's a big new He was probably the best of them, in my respect. 
Thank God that bastard is dead, though. He wasn't a genius, but he was a very evil man. One of the biggest Slavic hitters that ever existed, honestly. But let's put ourselves in, in his shoes for a minute. Channel that old creepy demonic bastard. And let's think. How would Zbigniew Brzezinski or one of these guys introduce CBDCs to the world? Right? It's a thought experiment to challenge ourselves. Now, it failed in that Nigeria. Most people don't all trust it. But if I, I were going to force it down people's throats, how would I do it? Well, the best way is to see it so you can give people a dollar or two of it as a kind of welfare. Okay, that's good. But an even better way is to extend credit line. Right? If you can give people a credit line in something, they will use it. And there's a system of reputation in there in place, kind of like Pax's reputation system, like a universal credit score, but better. Then you start to have, you know, a seed, a kernel of something that can grow. I believe this is the method they're going to take, or I would take, to introduce CBDCs to the world. But of course, I'm not going to do this with CBDCs. I'm going to do this with Bitcoin. Because my goal number one is to get people to see them in a little bit, even one Satoshi. Right. And then along with that comes the immersion as a user into the experience and the education thereof. Now, should you extend it into a system of credit and lending and get small business people involved, especially in rural areas, you will accelerate that tremendously. And once you bring small businesses in, they're attached to many nodes. So it will continue to spread. What else would you do on top of that? What would you do it differently? I don't know, man. I don't. Uh... I don't wake up thinking of taking over the world. I'm not trying to take over anything. I'm trying to save the world, bro. I'm just trying to get some money, some stats into people's hands, man. What are these accusations, bro? Well, this is what I call okay, actually. So you're not going to indulge me on this thought experiment while I get that? No, sure. well, it's, it, it's, it's difficult for me to think about it, uh, about it from this perspective. Like, I, I don't think any person's fortune is large enough to give away costs the tipping of, of the adoption of Bitcoin. You see, you get the five richest people in the world to give away all their money in free sats to people. And all you do is you just bought some Bitcoin. You know, the, the, the richest people in the world will buy the Bitcoin and then they'll give it to people and the people will just sell it because most people will aren't and ready to stack it. So I believe it needs to be organic. I don't really know how uh, to put it otherwise. Fair enough, my good man. I shall not reveal any further detail. These are the ruminations that possessed me on a daily level. And this is how I wake up, I think about this. I think about how to counter these dastardly evil old men. And to use their methods against them. But that's my life, bro. So yeah, just... Well, happy to have this, baby. Yeah. All right, well, let's let, let's get back to Paxful. Tell us what it is that you plan to do with Paxful moving forward. Well, it's not about any one company. Companies are a vehicle. What matters is the mission. And the mission to me is to create a billion citizens. And by a citizen, I mean someone that is daily active. Now, Bitcoin is enough to do that. Crypto is not enough to do that. Even all of fintech isn't enough to do that. There has to be something more. We have to provide civilization scale services to people. Store of value is clearly very important. Payments, very important. But communication is also is incredibly important. Now, I can't reveal a little too much about what I'm going to do in the future going over here. Because it's a sensitive point for me. But the mission continues and it must be taken to a whole new level. For the past 14 years, we've been trying to replace banks with wallets. And that is a failed approach. We have not moved at the speed that we need to. We have not set enough boots on the ground in the places that matter. So we must abandon this and we must focus on another narrative, different tactics. I have been doing this for the past seven years. So I'm armed with the understanding of that. I don't have to be the smartest guy in the room. To win, you just have to be willing to do what the other guy wants. And I have been willing to do that. And I have been doing it. And I have a great team around me now. I count Paxil's user base 12 million strong around the world and growing rapidly. Now it's time to take things to a whole new level. I want to unite the entire global south as one nation. 
by giving them the services that their own countries and only leaders have refused to give them or don't have the capacity to give them, communications store value payments. The telcos are who we should be studying, not the banks are trying to replace them. Look at Safaricom. They're the leading telco in Kenya. They launched m over 20 years ago. It's older than PayPal, older than Bitcoin. 98.9% of Kenyans have an m account. They do not have banking accounts. We should be studying that one. At the end of all of this, and very soon actually, I intend to be acquiring seats at these telcos and using them where they are the best capillary system to the streets that exists. And as we acquire more power, as more money begins to flow, as more people join this nation, there's a tremendous amount of good that we can do. Now we can tip the scales. Ultimately, where this battle ends is when we take back control of price discovery. Once the actual people are setting the price for things through real trade that is transparent, that lives on top of Bitcoin, then we have victory. Then we cannot go back. Then this sword, this gun that they have to the head of every global South nation will be largely mitigated. So to this effect, I will be building out a completely decentralized version of Pax. And if I have to kill my own babies, that's no problem, but I'm more than willing to do that. I'm more than willing to put myself out of business for the cause. Paxful is an American company. American company can never serve the 100%, brother. I've tried in seven years, eight years now with these regulators, and it just doesn't work. The system is built against them actually like enabling anyone to provide real services to the global south. They don't want that to happen. It is sold to the very DNA of the system. So that must be a band. Cannot work like that. Well, Sam is not the friend of the peoples of the world. America is a great country. I love the American dream. But the American dream is no longer found in America. I tend to bring that dream to the world. When my parents left Egypt, what was it, 44 years ago. I was a two-year-old boy. They did that. They left their friends, their family. They went to a place where they didn't speak the language, where they encountered racism and all these horrible things just to give us promise of better life because there was opportunity. I believe we can build a world where people won't have to leave home. And I've already begun these past seven years. It's been a very successful experiment, right? We proved that Bitcoin could be a medium of exchange in the global south. Well, the people proved that. I was just along for the ride and listening. We got Bitcoin into the global south, especially Africa, and they took it and ran with it. So what's the next step? I wish I could say more right now, but I'm going to have to surprise you all. Don't put me on the spot. No, it's it's always better to do than uh, talk. And it's, uh, it's better to just let your actions do the talking. So yeah, don't don't feel obliged to tell us anything. I, I, I generally also prefer to just do things and tell people about them when they're done. It's a much better way of uh, operating because when you talk about things, you kind of, uh, I, I feel like you discharge some of the energy that you have toward making them happen. When you tell people about them, you almost get a little bit of the sense of having accomplished it and then it takes away a little bit of the fire mm-hmm. of working on it. So yeah, you don't, need, you don't need to tell me anymore. But also more recently, you've uh, gotten rid of Ethereum from your platform. Uh, what was that all about? That should honestly never have happened. Uh, we had certain facets in the company that were trying to push NFTs, Ethereum, DeFi, all this junk. And I had to surgically remove those toxic elements within the company. And once I did that, I was like, hey, hey Ethereum. Mm-hmm. You know, I was defending Ethereum for a while when it was proof of work. And I saw there were applications like Aave, credit, lending, things like that. And I think this is you. This, this actually makes sense. It could actually help people we can kind of steer in the right direction. But once it went proof of stake, I said, no, that's, you know, all this degeneracy surrounding it, all of these scams that is perpetuated. It doesn't make sense anymore. We need to take this off our marketplace. Bitcoin is enough. Stable coins is enough. That's all that people need. They don't need this highly, this tool for the speculative industry to exist, especially now that it's proof of stake. I don't see any redeeming qualities about it. I don't care how many developers the Vitalik has moved over. Yes, there are a lot of very smart people in Ethereum, but 
Humanity has to keep the vast majority, preferably all of its momentum, behind one central clearing layer for us to have any chance of success, and that is Bitcoin. Anyone that argues at that point just does not understand the reality on the ground. They don't talk to users. They're just a bunch of soy boy F head DGENs that are, you know, playing these games in their head and looking for that next big, next big cash cow that they can they can mine. It's honestly it's disgusting. I don't see any good that it's gotten us. So it's gone. And you know, to me, they all when I announced this and I made it, I just said we're gonna do this. I got attacked, man. I got brigaded really hard, man. All these DJs came after me with their fifty little arguments, man, like, oh, but it's useful, it does table coins, uh -huh. it's uh, a wallet. I'm like, yeah, it does, but then it's all this fucking Tron, man. You're about as useful as Tron. In fact, even Tron is better than you, but man, I destroyed them, bro. They came after this kid, they grew up in Hell's Kitchen with their weak little Vitalik bullshit. I smashed them out of the park, man. I relished every moment of it, bro. They didn't know who they were messing with, man. They had the wrong idea, bro. I'd love, man, I'm a wartime CEO, bro. I can't wait for the next, the next incursion, bro. I live for this stuff. Yeah, and no, I think it's a, it's, it's a good choice because realistically, I think even as a business choice, even if it does give you extra revenue right now, it does create an enormous amount of liabilities into the future. You are effectively telling people to, when you're listing it on a place like Plaxful, you're, when you're listing securities in a place like Paxful, you're telling people that Bitcoin is similar to those things. And, and, and that's really why I think that this is the fraudulent element about digital currencies. Like they marketed themselves altcoins as being similar to Bitcoin. If you remember the marketing material for Ethereum at the beginning, it was unstoppable, decentralized applications. Well, it became very clear it's not decentralized. It's very stoppable. They've stopped it many times. They are for many times. So that just introduces all kinds of liabilities um, moving forward. Who knows what might happen to the rule book? They might change things. They might do all kinds of changes to the uh, way that the currency operates. And they've already done many, many changes to the supply. And so putting it out there on a platform like Paxful, you're just basically letting it benefit from the glow of Bitcoin where, yeah, well, you can use this decentralized thing, this Bitcoin that's yours, and then nobody can take it away from you. Or you can get into this giant Rube Goldberg regime in which nobody understands and there's a small group of people that can change the rules at any point in time. I can totally sympathize with why you wouldn't want to do that. And realistically, you know, there's all this stuff about, yeah, it has uses and so on. But realistically, though, the only thing that anybody ever uses Ethereum for is that they just buy and hold and stake. And that's just essentially Ponzi scheme. So they're running Ponzi schemes on top of the Bitcoin value proposition and like their recent pivot toward, you know, they got really apparently very influenced by all the talk about sound money and hard money in Bitcoin, that they went and changed their monetary policy so that the supply of Ethereum declines over time, which shows basically that the only thing they've got going for them is just try and piggyback on Bitcoin's uh, selling point. And that all of the stuff about all these other applications that they were supposed to be building it's just elaborate stories that end up launching a new coin and then a new Ponzi scheme around the new coin. And then there's a pump and dump. And then you move on to the next narrative and launch newer and more coins. That's all that there is to it. So not much of a loss, if you ask me. Absolutely, brother. I believe in integrity over revenue. You know, that's what's bootstrap. I've actually never raised money in my life. I don't trust these guys. Guys like A16 give me the creeps. I don't never trust a man that wants to live forever. You know, all, all these guys, they ain't very, um, it's, it's just mechanistic way of looking at the world and it just rubs me the wrong way. And Vitalik is very similar. I still remember when he was at the Bitcoin uh, BitDevs in New York, the Bitcoin uh, center, and he was introducing Ethereum. And he was like, yeah, this is going to be turning into a pleat. And I'm like, okay. Uh, so I, I saw it as a kind of, computer that was running on the blockchain that could do a lot of advanced stuff, which seemed like a cool experiment. And it has generated, you know, some cool projects. But by and large, you know, for all its technical merits, it really is a fraud, man. Honestly, I look at Vitalik right now and I, I think he's a scammer as well. I mean, just when I remember he was trying to pitch investors before Ethereum on uh, what was he doing? He was he was pitching an emulator for quantum computing. I mean, what, what, what the yeah. fuck, man? What, what, what is all this about? I'm like, 
I have respect for the guy. He's very good at wooing over these developers, but no, it just it, it doesn't feel right. It just does, and now it just it just completely just. I'm a very uh, graphic person, and I just want it away from me. And all these people in it, I just don't trust them. Their energy is very different than the Bitcoin community, and I don't want anything to do with it. And I don't want to give my stamp of approval on it because I don't want all these people in the global south thinking that this thing is kosher or halal, and that they can put that. I don't know. I have a responsibility to my community to keep them safe. And I can do whatever they want. They can go and they can buy it somewhere else. They can be, our wallet even supports it great, but it's not something that should proliferate. It's not something that should steal away any thunder from Bitcoin. We do not have time to waste. No, I agree entirely. Daniel has a question for you, Daniel. Yeah, hey guys. Hey Ray, great to be a fly on the wall of this, uh, of this podcast and this discussion. As always, really enjoyed your discussions here, guys. Uh, Ray, I'm going to ping a question at you. I ask at the end of each one of my shows, Safe's answered this a couple of times himself. Up to you guys if you uh, want to carry on after that. And uh, Safe wants to write on a parade of your answer. But uh, the, uh, the, the, the question is pretty simple. If you had one last orange pill left to give to somebody, who would you give that to and why? Someone that's alive? Up to you, brother. Up to you. Well, if I could choose between anyone dead or alive, I'd probably choose the dead guys first, man. I'd have to have my homeboy, Malcolm X, sitting here right next to me to my right and to my left. Johan Wolfgang von Goethe, man. I'm going in with these OGs savagely, bro. But if I had to choose two old boys to be one of those guys as for who's alive, I don't know, man, but uh, I, if I mentioned all some names right now, I could probably get in some serious trouble, so maybe I shouldn't have, man. No. This will have to be left the prize. Yo, bros, I wish you guys were at Satoshi Roundtable. It's going to be amazing right here, right? Now. You're going to see the unleashed ray going on, man. I hope no one's recording anything at that point. What can I say? Great question, good man. I always appreciate that. I think Malcolm X and Will Dante would have been Bitcoiners to the maximum. You know, what I love about Bitcoin is honestly in a sea of idolatry with all these shit coins. Bitcoin to me is like true monotheism. You know, these are powerful, strong people. They truly believe. Their hearts are in it. A lot of them, you'd be surprised. They give off the vibe of those people that just simply cannot be bought. They are in this to win for humanity. And that's beautiful to me. The most dangerous man is the man that cannot be bought. And these people, these Bitcoiners, we see things at a long time horizon. We're not thinking about the next pump and dump. We're looking at 20 years. And for me as a builder, it's so refreshing. It's so beautiful. That's how I can change the world. I'd rather keep my like small and strong on than anything else. Excellent. Well, yes, Nathan, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask, you guys were talking about remittances to Nigeria. And I wonder, do you have any feel for the amount and the difficulty of money coming in and out of Lebanon. I never hear anybody talk about that. Like, are remittances uh, an issue in terms of quantity? As an American company, we made the decision not to go near Lebanon, unfortunately. Venezuela, Russia, we had to move away from all those places, so I don't have any insight there. Honestly, it's fucking heartbreaking to me. It really makes me feel powerful to let those people down, but God willing, we'll be able to help them. So safe, maybe you have some insight. Um, I mean, there are all kinds of different uh, mechanisms for getting money in and out. A lot of it goes through exchange shops. These uh, have branches domestically and then in foreign countries, so you can uh, send money to them and get it in and out. So it, it's not all going through banks, and I think you can use the bank's for new money, if you send in money, but there, there's uncertainty about the fees and there's a problem with going into the bank and th there's a problem with taking your money out of the bank as well. So with the banks, it's complicated. With the uh, kind of Western Union, OMT type of businesses, it's a little bit, it's, it's a lot better, I presume, because you can just get paid in physical cash. But the problem there is the fees are higher and also the other problem is it's physical cash so then you know you're right, you've got a pile of cash and then you know it's it, you can't use the banking system very easily you can't uh, use it for payments so people have 
it's a, it's a serious issue with physical cash. Essentially, the problem in Lebanon at this point is the, basically the two most common bills are the 100 US dollar bill and the 100,000 liras. And the 100,000 liras is about a dollar and a half now in worth. And so, uh, so it's really complicated because in terms of dollars, there isn't that much supply of $1, $5, $10, $20, $10, $20, $50 bills. They are there, but they're just not that uh, common. So most of the time, if you're pay paying for something small, sandwich or coffee or whatever, you're not paying in dollars because very few people, well, not very few, but there's just not that much liquidity in terms of $1 and 5 and $10 bills. So you're either carrying a big giant stack of uh, pieces of uh, 100,000 liters, you know, the one and a half dollar or the $100. And since credit cards don't work in many places and there's all kinds of complications with that, it's massively inconvenient. Bitcoin adoption can't, just, can't come soon enough. You know, Daniel, I was thinking about your question and who's alive when I give that orange pill to? If this guy, Peter Obi, can win the election in Nigeria, and I can give him the orange pill, I think that would be amazing. Absolutely. I mean, Nigeria would be unleashed at that point. I don't think of that as my top choice, assuming he wins, which God willing, he will. Second choice, I'd have to put it at either CC in Egypt, because if Egypt got you know, bitten by the orange pill, he's strong enough as a leader to get all the Egyptians to move with them. You know, Egyptians are very stubborn. They are a very strong, heavy-handed leader. But once you have that, I think the Egyptian people would, I mean, it'd be amazing if that happened. Beyond that, I'd have to say India. You know, you've got 1.5 billion people. And honestly, you know, Paxful is just a wall at 2.0. And the world, you know, the Bitcoin project to me is not complete until it, there is that open market that allows Bitcoin to be exchanged for everything else. I believe Satoshi also believed the same thing, but he did not have the time to build that out. And the Indian people have been practicing Hawala for over 1,400 years, and they still continue to remain practitioners of Hawala. Imagine 1.5 billion people pushing Hawala. It would be absolutely amazing. It's just their leader, Modi, he seems to be a kind of Hindu supremacist. So spiritually, I don't think he'd be able to do much with it. But if we had someone in India that could, that was of the right spiritual leaning, I think it would be amazing. Honestly, I would give that my, my top choice. But if I can get the CC and drop an orange pill in his, uh, you know, chai with, uh, with mint, that'd be, <laughs> I think that would be a winner. <laughs> I would feel very good about that as an Egyptian. I would be so proud. Great question. Thanks for thinking about it. All right, well, Ray, thank you so much. We've already taken so much of your time, man. This has been uh, enormously fascinating. I wish you and Paxful all the best of luck in everything that you do in Nigeria and Egypt and everywhere else. Keep getting those sets into people's hands. Don't worry too much about getting into power and uh, all these fantasies just Stay humble, stack sats, and help people stay humble, stack sats, and that's all we need. Yes, sir. <laughs> awesome. Take care. Thank you, brother.